Okay, so we're now recording. So, uh, well, welcome everybody who's chosen to come. I'm sorry there was so much confusion over today's lecture. Um, the, the video will go up fairly soon after we've finished, uh, in which case those that have decided not to make it or couldn't make it can watch it then. And tomorrow's lecture is actually quite a short one. So we can easily spend time answering questions on today's lecture if we need to. Um, so what I'm going to do is start talking about welding technology now. Um, we've got a four lecture course uh, covering welding. Today's lecture is just an introduction to a number of the processes that we use to weld metals together. Um, Tomorrow's lecture, lecture two, is a short look of some of the physics of welding processes, what's actually going on when you melt two pieces of metal together. The third lecture, next Monday, we're going to have a brief look at welding metallurgy, in particular what happens to standard structural steels when you weld them together. And then lecture four is going to start looking at all the things that can go wrong with welding and the steps that you can take to avoid that so you don't put a weld into service that's going to run away from its responsibilities fairly early on. Um, so that's the overview. This lecture, we're basically going to define what we mean by welding. And we're then going to go on and look at a number of common processes used to weld metals together. We'll provide an overview of welding as a technology, very short. We'll then spend some time at what we call flux based arc welding processes and what that means will become apparent. Then we're going to look at flux less arc welding processes. And again, that will mean a little bit more, hopefully, at the end of the lecture than at the beginning. We're then going to move on to laser and electron beam welding, which on the face of it look a little bit more exciting. Um, and they say something about solid state welding processes. Uh, and then we'll summarize. So it's basically a short canter through how you do welding. So we need a definition to start off with. Um, what do we mean by welding? Well, here's one definition you can find in a textbook. It's a union between two pieces of metal that are rendered plastic or liquid by heat or pressure or both. And you can use a filler metal between them with a melting temperature of the same order as that of the parent material if you want to. So that's one definition. And here's another. A localised coalescence of metals or non-metals produced either by heating the materials to the welding temperature with or without the application of pressure or by the application of pressure alone with or without the use of a filler metal. So to unpack that, there's a key message here. What we're doing is we're taking two subcomponents, which we may have made by machining, forging, whatever, and we're forming a metallic bond across the interface between uh, the two components. So you go from parent material through to material that's melted or got very hot, which we call the weld metal, and then back to parent material on the other side. So we have a continuous material microstructure. Um, now that microstructure may change dramatically, and we'll see that in lecture three, um, and indeed in lecture two as well. But the key message is you're basically converting two components into one component. So why bother? Why use a welding process? Well, primary reason is you can produce a seamless joint with continuity of material. In other words, you start with two plates, you weld them together, you've got one plate. Uh, it's just twice the size. A high quality welded joint will generally be longer than the other options that you have for joining two components together, like riveting or bolting. Um, It'll also be lighter than a bolted or riveted connection because there's no need to overlap the two components that you're welding together. If you rivet or bolt things together, you either have to overlap them and rivet through where they're overlapped, 
or you have to overlap them and bolt through, which means you need bolts as well, which also adds to weight and complication. Or you butt them up and you put gusset plates on either side, more material, and you bolt through or rivet through those. So a welded joint avoids all the complications of overlaps, gusset plates, bolts and rivets. It also avoids the need for sealants and gaskets. Once you've welded two plates together, you've effectively got a pressure tight joint. Uh, if you rivet plates together, you've got to deal with the fact that you might, uh, fluid or gas might be able to get through the interface between the two plates that you riveted together. So if you think about how ships are manufactured, uh, traditionally metal ships were riveted together by large gangs of men in shipyards. And you had to make sure not only that those riveted joints were strong enough, which meant you had all the weight of the overlaps and the rivets, you had to also make sure that those joints did not leak because you were after all sending a ship out to sea. And once welding was developed, shipbuilders grabbed it with alacrity because it allowed them to make ships lighter, quicker and more easily watertight and therefore cheaper as well. Another advantage of a welded joint is it doesn't have built in crevices. So again, a bolted or riveted joint's got built in crevices between the bolts and the holes, between the rivets and their holes, between the plates that you're joining. And if you've got crevices and you've got fluids, you can get corrosion. Um, and I'm sure you've observed this in simple components that corrosion very often takes place or starts at joints. And by design, a welded joint doesn't have any crevices, although if you make the weld wrong, it can have them. Um, so that will reduce the likelihood of corrosion. So there's quite a few reasons why you might want to use a welded joint. So what would an ideal welded joint look like? Well, what you'd ideally, you'd like to be able to weld the two plates together and then not be able to find where you welded them. You'd like it to be indistinguishable from the parent material in every way. Same microstructure, same strength, same toughness, absolutely everything. Um, now, there's generally limited value in making your welded joint stronger than the two pair of materials that you're going to join. Uh, now we call that an overmatched weld because you can't make use of it because you have to transmit load from the parent material into the weld and then out again. So the fact the weld's stronger does not help you. Um, the other problem is certainly in steels. If the weld zone is stronger than the parent material, it's likely to have a lower toughness and to be more susceptible to brittle fracture, which you do not want. If the welded joint has a different microstructure or composition to the parent material, this raises the possibility of galvanic corrosion, which you don't want, or anisotropy in mechanical properties. And we will see later on that actually it's very, very difficult to make a weld with a microstructure that's in indistinguishable from the parent material. In fact, it's probably impossible. Um, now, of course, there's one caveat to all of this is welds are often in are always inspected. And so if you make your ideal welded joint, you generally speaking still need to know where it is because your certification authority will require you to perform non-destructive examination on it. And that's something we'll also look at in uh, the last lecture. So how do you weld? Well, there's three basic classes. Um, welding is how you join materials. It usually involves heat, pressure, or both. So if we start out with heat-based processes, and I've listed four there, uh, in increasing order of sophistication and capital equipment costs. Um, so there's gas flame welding, which is literally what it says. You strike a gas flame uh, like a Bunsen burner, and then you heat something up with it. And if it's got a low enough melting point, the gas flame will melt it. You can use it to form a joint. Electric arc welding is a much more concentrated source of energy, and we'll talk quite a lot about that. And here, the heat is coming from the flow of electricity um, in an arc. Laser welding, where the energy comes in through a laser beam, and electron beam welding, where the energy comes in through accelerating electrons into the component that you're planning to weld. 
and they've all got different characteristics. Then there's pressure-based processes, and that's where you're effectively using, well, the first two, friction welding and friction stir welding, you're basically using a combination of pressure and friction to generate heat, which allows you to bond your two materials together. Ultrasonic welding is very high frequency vibration. An explosive welding is what it says on the tin. You go bang and instead of two components, you have one. And that's probably one to watch actually. I don't know how often it works. Nothing could possibly go wrong with that one. And then there are techniques that use combined pressure and heat. And one I'd like to note there is forge welding, is that if you remember open for, open, an open die forging from four or five lectures ago with the blacksmith banging the very hot metal component with his hammer, one of the things a blacksmith can do is to fold over the component and then bang it with his hammer and create one material where there were two before. The interface gradually disappears under combination of pressure and heat. And of course, that's how traditionally swords were made, by continually reforging to get an optimal microstructure. OK, let's now have a look at arc welding processes, because those are the most common ones you're likely to experience. In arc welding, your power is coming from electricity. You've got an electric power supply, and that power supply is used to establish an electric arc between something we call the welding electrode and the workpiece. So current is flowing uh, from the power supply down the electrode, jumping across to the workpiece and out to earth or back to the power supply through the workpiece. That's where our energy is coming from. And electric arcs are work because you if you have a high current low voltage uh system running across a small gap you can generate a plasma discharge an arc which generates a lot of heat in a very small area it's quite high density so you have a high current relatively low voltages and you concentrate the energy dissipation in that electric arc which you can use to melt the material now, there are complications because the electrode, the bit that um, supplies the start of the arc, it can either be non-consumable or consumable. And we'll show you what that means in a moment. The power supplies can be either DC or AC, which we won't say anything more about at this level. And a critical thing is that you have to protect the molten weld pool, the material you've got very hot and melted, from the atmosphere, because if you don't, the oxygen in the atmosphere will react with the molten weld metal to form oxides. Those oxides can then become entrained in the solidifying weld metal and cause defects. So you really, really do not want to oxidize a weld pool. It's a very bad idea. Um, and so you have to protect the molten and very hot metal from the oxygen in the atmosphere. And there's two ways of doing it. You can use something called a flux, which forms a protective solid layer of something we call slag. Or you can use an inner gas that you blow over the surface to keep the oxygen away. And we'll see both of these in a few minutes. So let's start off with perhaps the simplest of processes. This is what we call shielded metal arc welding. It's also called manual metal arc welding and stick welding. And stick welding is a pretty good description of what it actually is. Um, you've got a handheld electrode holder. So you can see that gentleman on the left. He's swathed in protective equipment. He's got leather gauntlets, a leather jacket, a leather hat, and a face mask with a very, very um, dark glass filter to protect his eyes from the ultraviolet radiation that comes off from the electric arc. He's also holding an electrode into which is clamped a stick of material. So the current is flowing through that electrode down the stick into that pipe that he's welding. And the arc is struck between this consumable electrode and the weld pool that's inside that component. And this thing flux, which we put on the outside, is a mixture of chemical compounds that when they get very hot, 
they react with the oxygen in the atmosphere and then they solidify onto the molten surface of the weld pool. They stay on the surface and they form a barrier to stop oxygen getting in. So flux is quite complicated stuff. It's designed to react with the oxygen in the atmosphere, solidify on the surface of the weld pool and protect it from the atmosphere. Now, one side effect of that is because the flux solidifies onto the weld pool, it helps with controlling the shape of that weld pool when it's out of position. What we mean by out of position is the sort of thing we can see this man doing here. He's going to go round underneath the pipe and weld from underneath, which means he doesn't want the molten metal to gloop out and run up his arms while he's trying to make the weld. And having solid flux, flux that solidifies on the surface, helps to maintain stability of the weld pool when you're doing what we call out of position welding. Now we can weld in any position from above, from the sides, from underneath with shielded metal arc welding. Because it's a manual process, it requires a very high level of skill from the welder and it has a relatively low productivity. It doesn't actually, it takes quite a long time. So I've got a video to show you now of uh, shielded metal arc welding of nozzles on a nuclear pressure vessel. So if we get that started, it's a little bit noisy in the background. Um, with a bit of luck, has that not started? Now it started, right, good. Um, wait for that. There we have the welder. You can see he's holding the electrode with the stick. There's a very bright light where the arc is and he's protected from it by his visor. And what he's doing is laying down a weld pass in the weld groove you can just see there inside that nozzle. He's welding an extension piece onto that nozzle. Now he's turned the arc off, you can see the dark slag on the surface. So that dark material is a slag that's formed to protect the weld surface from oxidising. And it has to be removed prior to doing another weld because you don't want that slag around when you weld over the top. So you see he's removing it there. We've now got another little bit of welding going on. So here we've got two welders and you can see here they're welding up from below. So they're taking advantage of slag now to, to control the weld pool so the bead they laid down stays where they want it. You're not just relying on surface tension, you're actually helping it to stay there with the solidified slag. Okay, so that's going to run on for a little bit longer with people talking in the background. And we'll stop it in a moment, it's got a little bit longer to run. One of the things you then do at the end, if you remember me talking about crevice corrosion in a, a bolted joint, once you've completed a weld like this, you usually grind off the top surface of the weld, what we call the weld cap or the weld crown, because that's got quite a rough surface. Um, so it's potentially a site for preferential attack due to crevice corrosion. It also makes it difficult to perform inspection on the weld uh, because you can't do ultrasonics through a rough surface very easily. So that's something we'll come back to in lecture four. OK, that was shielded metal arc welding. Now we've got flux cord arc welding, which is one step up from that. So this is now semi-automatic or automatic. It's got a little device. You can see one on the left hand side. You've got a handheld torch, so you've got a handheld welding torch rather than a clip with a stick sticking out of it. It's got a trigger and that trigger controls the, the filler wire feed because what you do is you feed filler wire down the centre of that trigger from a spool so it comes continuously. It's not a stick that gets consumed and then you have to stop. And here we embed the flux granules in the core of the filler wire. So they're fed into the weld pool, not from the outside, but from the center where they react with um, the atmosphere. They float to the surface, react with the atmosphere and form the protective layer of slag. So it's subtly different. Similarly to shielded metal arc welding, having that flux there means you can weld out of position. All welding positions are possible. Now this is requires a little bit less skill than shielded metal arc welding and it runs a little bit faster. So that's flux cord arc welding. 
Then the next one in the flux based welding is what we call submerged arc welding. And there's a picture of a submerged arc welding kit on the left, which we'll go through. This is mechanized. Um, what we do is we feed filler wire continuously from a spool. And I think this particular one is feeding three filler wires simultaneously. Um, and the flux is supplied by pumping granular material into the welding groove and filling it up. And then you do your welding underneath this huge pile of flux. Uh, like this one here, we can use multiple welding heads to increase productivity. You can only weld from above because otherwise the flux will all fall out. And that's called 1G. But it, and it doesn't require much skill because this is fully mechanized. You've just got to drive the machine. And it has a very high productivity. You can lay a lot of weld metal down with this process very quickly if your weld design is suitable for it. And there's a picture there showing the flux layer. And this little diagram shows what's going on. You can see the filler wire coming down here with the arc struck from the end of the filler wire. You can see the flux being fed into a, from a hopper. So the arc is completely buried under granular flux. What you end up underneath it is a weld pool with solidified weld metal behind it and a layer of solidified slag on top, plus a whole load of excess flux, which you can actually reuse next time. So that's submerged arc welding. Now, all these flux based processes have relatively similar characteristics um, and they've got diff the same sort of advantages and disadvantages. Now, apart from submerged arc welding, which is machine based and therefore you do it in a factory with a roof, um, flux based processes are generally well suited to going out of position and welding out of doors. So if you see a man welding in a yard or up a crane or something like that, he'll be probably using a flux based process, shielded metal arc welding or the other one. Um, now, the other advantage to them is you've got a wide range of electrode and filler wire compositions available uh, because it's quite easy to mix and match the, the core of the sticks or the flux. So there's quite a lot of versatility there. They have disadvantages. There's a significant risk of flux inclusions with these processes. And in fact, you find on something like a nuclear pressure vessel, which is eight inches thick, and would have a several hundred pass weld, you'll find that submerged arc welding was generally used on vessels made 20 or so years ago, like size will be. Uh, Hinkley C being built at the moment uses a welding process we'll talk about in a minute in order to avoid the risk of flux inclusions. The other problem with them is fluxes tend to attract moisture. So they'll sit there and if you store them badly, and in high humidity, they will attract moisture. If you then weld with wet electrodes, the water in the flux that's basically accumulated there because you've not stored it right, ionizes in the arc, uh, which means you get hydrogen. If you get hydrogen in a steel, it can embrittle it. And that's a known problem. It causes something called delayed or cold cracking. So very often when you're doing a flux based welding process, you have to make sure that all your electrodes or your flux are baked in an oven to dry them before they're used. And clearly, if you're welding up a ladder in the rain, that might be quite difficult. So there is there are potential issues with them. Now let's move on to gas tungsten arc welding, which is subtly different. And um, there's a little diagram of how it works on the left here you have a non-consumable tungsten electrode. In other words, you're not using up that electrode. You can you profile it very carefully to produce the right kind of arc. And then you strike your arc between that electrode and the workpiece, which means you can carefully control the electrode to workpiece distance at all times. You then introduce the filler as a separate filler wire, which you can control independently from the electrode and you protect it from the atmosphere, not with flux granules or something like that, but by pumping an inner gas over the surface like argon, which means that there's no possibility of oxidation. Now this produces very high quality welds and that's one of the reasons why they use it on Hinkley C now. Um, it tends to have a low deposition rate because it's a more complex process and it tends to run with slightly lower heat inputs than say submerged arc welding. 
because you don't use multiple wire filler wires at the same time. It's often fully automated. This is the one you will automate with a programmable controller. Um, and so that's this you will encounter where people want to make high quality arc welds. And here's another look at how gas tanks and arc welding works. Now, what you can see there is two plates that I'm going to butt weld together. You can see a black line where I'm going to weld them. And you notice the little sign saying this is a microstructurally engineered material. So someone's gone to a lot of trouble through alloy design, casting technology, potentially even how they formed it to get a nice microstructure in this to get optimal mechanical properties. And let's bear that in mind because we'll come back to that in another lecture. So the torch is there. You strike the arc between the tungsten electrode and the workpiece. And then you pump in a gas down this gas cup, which is coaxial with the electrode, to surround the arc and the weld pool with inert gas. And of course, you then melt it. So you have a molten zone and you have a hot but solid zone around it as heat flows out into the workpiece. You introduce filler metal through the wire. And then having done that, you make the weld. And this is a little uh, commercial for what happens in later lectures. Once you've made the weld, then the weld pool solidifies and the heat affected zone cools down. And you can see a number of things have happened here. You've got this thing called the fusion zone, which we'll talk about in another lecture, which probably has a different microstructure to the parent material on either side. You've got this thing called the heat affected zone, which again has interesting microstructural issues. And it's distorted a bit and have generated something called residual stress. So this isn't specific to TIG welding, gas tanks and arc welding. It's happened in all welding processes to a greater or lesser extent. But this is just a little highlight for what might happen when you look into the future. This is an example of a small TIG welding machine or gas tanks and arc welding machine. You can see it's a linear track programmable one. So you can tell this one to move up and down a track at a given rate and do different things at the beginning and end of a limited length weld. You can see it's got a gas cup with a tungsten electrode at the end. It's got a wire feed coming there with wire with a filler wire coming down. If we look closer, you can see the gas cup in pink, the profile tungsten electrode in silver and the filler wire coming in here. We're going to fill this groove with weld metal in a single pass. And that's those things there are thermocouples that have been put on to measure the transient temperatures during welding. OK, so gas tanks and arc welding, what does it do for us? Well, the good things are that you could independently control the heat source and the addition of filler metal. That's difficult to do in these um, shielded metal arc welding or the slightly more mechanized form whose acronym I can't remember at the moment. It's a readily automated process, it doesn't involve fluxes, which is good, and it does produce very high quality welds. The disadvantages are it's got a low productivity. It takes a long time to make a TIG weld because you can't lay down as much weld metal in a pass as you can with, say, submerged arc welding, and you can't lay it down as fast. And if you do it manually, which it is possible to do, although what I've shown you is mechanised welding, then you really do need a good operator because they've got to control the electrode and the filler separately. OK, and then there's something called gas metal arc welding, and this is a bit like gas tanks and arc welding. It's semi-automatic or automatic. You can see it's got a nice little piece of kit you can buy from the welding supplier. It's got a handheld torch with a trigger. It feeds filler wire continuously from a spool. Now, you've heard this before with the other process that has equipment that looks a bit like this. The difference is that we've got a gas shield now. We're pumping inert gas in around the outside of the filler wire. Um, but we are, in fact, melting the filler wire to form the electrode. So this is something where the way metal transfer from the filler wire to the weld pool takes place, changes according to the welding parameters. You can do this in pretty well any welding position, and it does require some skill. And it's got a, an intermediate productivity.
and this will show you'll just talk about its features and then you'll show i'll show you a picture of it um if you have a it's got a power source that allows it to self-correct its arc length um i won't go into that it's easily automated and it's actually less complex than gas tungsten arc welding which is why it's very popular this is probably the sort of thing that people buy to weld their cars um Gas, the GMAW, gas metal arc welding, can produce very good weld quality with good deposition rates, but it's prone to spatter. And in fact, you may find that you've got a limited number of filler metal compositions that are available. Now, this diagram shows how GMAW differs from gas tungsten arc welding. You can see you've got a copper contact tip at the top, but instead of the tungsten electrode, you're now feeding the filler wire down the middle of the gas cup. And you've got, as it melts at the end, droplets continuously detach and are blown down into the weld pool. Um, there's a detached droplet. And I think that's a function of the way the electrical field works. It's not blown down by the nozzle and the inert gas. But you can see you melt the end of the filler wire, the droplets drop into the weld pool. Um, and the whole thing is protected by inert gas in the same way that gas tungsten arc welding is. So that's GMAW. Now we're going to change focus. We'll have a look at electron beam welding. Now there's a diagram on the left showing the cross section of a whole series of different electron beam welds. They can range from flat to very long and thin. And I'll explain why in a moment. Um, what we do here is we accelerate electrons in an electric field till they're moving very, very fast, and then we bombard a metal surface with them. And the electrons decelerate, they give up their kinetic energy as heat in the material that they've hit. So you're heating the thing up by bombarding it with electrons at high speed. Now, you usually carry out electron beam welding in a vacuum, a high vacuum, because if you didn't, the electron beam would scatter. You'd accelerate all your electrons and they'd start bouncing off nitrogen, oxygen and all the rest, carbon dioxide, in the air. And so rather than a nice, tight, straight, collimated beam, you'd have a big splurge. So electron beam welding is usually a high vacuum process. Um, now you can do it with or without filler metal. And the, the amount of penetration you get the shape of the molten zone depends upon how you operate the electron beam. It depends on its power, its power density, its welding speed, the material properties and the joint geometry. But one of the features of this is you can go from A and B on the left, which, where, which is where you're basically running with a fairly low power density and you're melting the material to form a sort of puddle, just like arc welding. If you get the power density high enough, you start to vaporize material and you form something called a keyhole. Basically, you blow a hole into the material. You vaporize metal straight out into the air above it or the vacuum above it, and you melt the material on either side. That allows you to get energy all the way down to the bottom of quite thick plates. So you can then generate a weld with very straight sides and a very narrow process. Effectively, what happens is that the electron gun, the, the electron beam, generates a keyhole all the way through, which means that some of the electrons are going out the other side, and we'll see that in the example in a minute. When you start that moving, then as it moves, material melts ahead of it, some of it gets ejected either out the back or vaporizing out the top and the rest of it flows round the keyhole and then solidifies as the beam moves away from it so although you have a hole all the way through or a long way into your component because the electron beam is vaporizing the metal when it's passed on you form a continuous welded joint and you can get something very thin and narrow and here's an example. That's an electron beam where we've welded a collar onto a pipe. The weld itself is only 0.8 millimeters thick and it's 26 millimeters long. Now you cannot do that with arc welding. You can do it with electron beam welding and you'll see we can do it with um, 
laser welding as well in a moment. But that's one of its advantages. It can make a very deep and a very narrow weld in a single weld pass. Um, and because you can make very big electron guns, you can weld very thick sections. Now this slide says 150 millimeters maximum thickness. Actually, you can do you can get to 200. We've sourced welds with 200 millimeter wall thickness. Um, that's eight inches thick in one pass. Now it generates less distortion than for arc welding processes, and we'll see why that is in a later lecture. But it has disadvantages. Generally speaking, you need to put your components inside a vacuum chamber, which means they have to go to the vacuum chamber, which means it has to be done in a factory, generally speaking. Um, and of course, your component has to fit inside the vacuum chamber, which means the bigger compo the component, the bigger the vacuum chamber. Now, it also can have difficulties in welding dissimilar materials. And something not mentioned on the slide is that if there's any residual magnetism in the steels that you're welding, the electron beam wanders around and you can end up with problems with your weld, but we haven't mentioned that on this slide. So here's an example. We're gonna weld a thick section nuclear pressure vessel steel. This example is an 80 millimeter wall thickness nuclear pressure vessel steel. That's four inches thick, and we're gonna weld it in a single weld pass. And as I said, you could do this up to 200 millimeters if your gun was big enough. Now, if you wanted to make the same weld, 80 millimeters wall thickness um, in submerged arc or gas tungsten arc, you'd be talking about hundreds of weld passes, which means the weld takes days to make rather than minutes. That's the attraction of electron beam welding for thick sections. But a large vacuum chamber is usually required, although there is a lot of work being done to build local vacuum equipment that tracks around the outside of a large component while you weld it. And this is an example. Um, here we are, what we're going to do, I'm sorry about the noise, we're going to weld that welded plate, which you can see just here. So the first thing we have to do is to put it inside a vacuum chamber. Now this chamber is designed to weld large circumferential components like pressure vessels, which is why you've got such a large turntable. Um, but I think the key message here is that we're going to, you need expensive kit to do electron beam welds. You can see our component, that's four inches thick. Um, we're gonna weld that from the right in, a, in a, a later short video. So you can see you're going into a large vacuum chamber, another piece of expensive capital equipment. We'll just let that finish doing its Thunderbirds thing. Probably stop this one now. Go on to the next slide. Uh, this just shows you the door closing on the vacuum chamber to get an idea of just how big it is. This is a very serious piece of kit. So you're talking about welding vessels that are several meters in diameter in this component. So we'll just let that door close because we actually now have to pump that chamber down to a very high vacuum before we weld it. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. If you want to watch this at length, it'll be in the, um, we'll upload the video separately. Um, okay, and this, is, this will now show us the electron beam welding process in action. Now, before I start it, if you look on the right, the electron gun is inside this assembly on the right. You can see a green glow here, and that is ionization of the metal ions that are being ejected from the keyhole, which allows us to actually see the electrons. That's basically the electrons going in. They're hitting metal ions that we're evaporating, and so those are getting excited and they're glowing, which allows us to see the electron beam. We've then got this thick component, and what we'll also see is the fact that the, the, the electron beam is going right through it. It's blowing a certain amount of material out of the back, 
and then the electrons are finally crashing into a plate at the back and decelerating to nothing. So you have to have something at the back to catch those electrons, otherwise they'll burn a hole in the side of your vacuum chamber if you're doing full penetration weld. So if we start this, it does look quite a hairy process. You can see you're blowing material out of the back. What you're actually doing is you've got a hole all the way through that component. That's and a very good view actually, isn't it? Sorry, and that's me talking too much. And you're, you'll do the entire well from one end of that plate to the other in a few minutes. So we'll let this run to completion. Quite a lot of material being ejected out of the back of this. There we go. So that's electron beam welding. Um, now laser welding is actually quite similar. Um, it's, it's using a beam. Um, in this case, it's a coherent beam of light, of photons, but these photons still carry kinetic energy and they share their kinetic energy with the workpiece and heat it up. And laser welding can be done with high enough power densities to do what we call keyhole welding, which is what I described for electron beam welding where you vaporize material and produce a long narrow hole of vaporized material, which means that you can get the photons all the way down to the bottom of a weld and make it straight sided and narrow. Narrow welds, relatively low distortion, but it differs from electron beam welding in some ways. <coughs> it doesn't need a vacuum. You generally don't need a vacuum to run laser welding unless your power density is very high, then you do need a vacuum because if your power density, uh, if your photon energy is high enough, then you can start to ionize material and it'll start to scatter. Um, it's less vulnerable to dissimilar material properties. It's not vulnerable to magnetism, but penetration is generally less than for electron beam welding. Basically, lasers are just not as powerful. Um, the best we've ever done, or had done by researchers working with us, rather than 200 millimetre thick for EB welding, I think we've got up to 80 millimetres thick, but you do it on two sides. So you do 40 millimetres from one side and 40 millimetres from the other. So you can see that the power densities and the powers you've got are significantly lower. There's another variant of laser welding, which is hybrid laser arc welding. So what you do here is, Laser welding allows you to do rapid welding of parts with low heat input and low distortion, just like um, EB welding. What you often do is put the, the welding head on a robot. Uh, that's very common to have robot laser welding. Now it requires a good joint fit up. Um, on the left, there's a picture showing poor joint fit up. In other words, your two components that you're going to weld together, if you want to weld them using laser welding in keyhole mode, or indeed electron beam welding in keyhole mode, you've got to have a good fit up. You mustn't have gaps or gaps that develop. You mustn't have misalignment because the, the amount of material you melt is so small that you cannot accommodate large gaps or poor fit up. Whereas arc welding is very forgiving. It's surprising what you can weld together with arc welding um, and, and, and get an acceptable weld with relatively poor joint fit up. What you can do is you can actually combine it with arc welding to improve the tolerance to poor joint fit up. You can do a hybrid laser arc weld. Um, the most common form of hybrid laser arc welding is uh, combining gas metal arc welding, which we talked about earlier, with laser welding. Um, now here's an example of hybrid laser welding. This is hybrid laser gas tungsten arc welding. Um, so what we're doing here is we're doing a multi-pass weld. Let me just turn the well, that's, let's turn that off. We're doing a multi-pass weld, and again a nuclear pressure vessel steel. You can just about see the laser light coming down on the other side of that shield. And it's occasionally visible because of spatter coming back from the well. But what we're also doing is we're feeding filler wire in and we're putting a current through that filler wire to melt it as it goes in. So you've got some melting of filler wire and you've got some melting going on due to the laser. So that's a hybrid laser weld being made. Okay. <laughs> 
Finally, today, I want to talk about friction welding. Now here, you don't use an electric arc, you don't use an electron beam, you don't use um, uh, a laser. You basically use mechanical friction. You rub things together until they get hot. So you generally have a moving workpiece and a stationary component. So one example is rotary friction welding, um, where you can actually have weld pipes together using this, because one's rotating, one's non-rotating. You force them together. You usually have a force pushing them together to fuse them. Uh, so you've got pressure and rotation. And that allows you to form a welded joint. Now, it doesn't melt. It just gets really hot and squishy, um, a bit like the blacksmith and his hammer um, but doing his pressure and heat welding. So this particular form of welding doesn't melt the material. It's a solid state welding process. And that can be a really good thing because it means you haven't got your material as hot and as we see, we'll see in later lectures, the hotter you get it for longer, the more likely you are to get undesirable microstructural changes. So friction welding helps you here because you can avoid some undesirable microstructural changes. You can use it to join dissimilar metals as well. And a variant of that is something called friction stir welding, which I'm going to show you a short video of. What you do here is you have a tool, a rotating tool that spins and you lower it into the material and then you move that tool while still rotating through the material. And what it does is it deforms and softens the material ahead of the tool, spins it round behind the tool and then leaves it to form a welded joint behind it. Now it sounds like alchemy, but it does work. So what I'm gonna do is show you um, a bit of friction stir welding. So if we look at this one, what this is going to do, and again, I'll turn this on, so hopefully you can see this, the tool starts to spin. We just have to be patient and wait for it to start spinning. There we are, that tool is spinning. So the spinning tool will generate friction between it and the workpiece. So as you lower the tool down, and of course, this is made of a very high strength, high melting point material. It comes into contact with your metal workpiece and it starts to deform it and it softens it due to friction and then pushes the soft material out of the way. So that's plunging into the workpiece and creating a, a cylindrical hole. Now, if that was all you did, it would be a useless process. But what you'll find now is it's going to start moving towards you in a minute. Just wait for it. Are we moving yet? Not quite. We haven't quite got to full depth. Now it's coming towards us. So it's that you're basically dragging that rotating tool through that solid metal. You're softening it and you're pushing it round to the back. You can see that the material that's been extruded from the top is going round the back. The same thing's happening inside because of that, uh, because the tool has an appropriate profile. And as it comes closer and closer to this edge, it's not leaving a hole behind it, it's leaving a welded joint. So once it lifts out, You can see that between the entry hole and the exit hole, you've got a welded joint. There you are. You can see it's a continuous joint all the way to the point at which the tool lifted out. So let's unshare that. It looks like alchemy, but it does actually work. Um, and it's, it's used for aluminium alloys quite extensively because they, um, they're actually un metal often metallurgically unstable um, if you get them too hot, but you still want to weld them. So that's friction stir welding. So 
Final remarks. I think we've just about kept within time. Um, the message from today's lecture is welding is a very broad field. There are lots of ways you can join materials together. Um, what we've looked at is a range of fusion welding processes. Let's just call that. A range of fusion welding processes, including arc welding, laser welding, electron beam welding, and laser hybrid welding. And all of these actually melt the material. And in some cases, like laser and electron beam, they can vaporize it as well. Um, there are many other welding processes in existence, and they're often developed for, for specific applications or joint configurations. So this is just an overview. Um, one that's used a lot now is laser welding. Um, that tends to be developed quite a lot because of its ability to accurately weld small components with robotic control. Um, and friction stir welding is another one which is, is being developed quite rapidly at the moment. Electron beam welding is one I'm involved in. So there's quite a lot going on. But what this lecture is to do is to just give you a feeling for the sorts of welding processes that we use and their advantages and disadvantages. OK, so that's the end of today's lecture. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, please ask. Um, tomorrow's lecture will be much shorter than today, so there'll be ample opportunity to ask questions tomorrow as well. And of course, we'll have the Wednesday evening drop in session too. So if you've got any questions, then um, I'd be happy to take them.